All right, uh, welcome to the online causal inference seminar. Um, today, we are excited to have Ismail Mourifier from the University of Toronto, who will talk about testing identification assumptions in fuzzy uh, regression discontinuity designs. Uh, one of his collaborators, uh, Toro Kitagawa, is, uh, is in the Q&A today. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, post them in Q&A. Um, after the, well, during the talk, Ismail will also uh, take a break to take questions. So. So please uh, let us know about our, your questions. After the talk, uh, we will have a discussion by Zhu Pei from Cornell. So uh, we're excited about that. And then after that, uh, Ismail will, uh, will be able to respond. OK, um, I'm now switching over to uh, Michael, who will uh, handle the questions today. Uh, thanks, Dominic. So uh, like Dominic said, we have, we're very uh, lucky to have Tori with us today to help with questions, so please submit your questions through Q&A. Uh, keep in mind that uh, the questions may be displayed publicly, uh, and uh, we also may uh, reach out to you uh, if uh, we think that uh, you should ask your question live. Uh, and in that case, we'll uh, ask you to raise your hand if you're willing to ask the question live. Uh, so with that, uh, Ismail, feel free to begin whenever you're ready. Sure. So. Let me try to share my screen. So, so I will try to share my my iPad screen. So, sorry for the. Yes, looks like. Okay, that should be. Okay, I guess that should be fine now. Yes. Okay. That's good. So, so thank you for the invitation, and you know it's a pleasure for me to present this joint work with uh, Turu, Yoshi, uh, Yushin, and Yuan Yuan. Okay, so Turu is there to to answer the Q and A questions, so that I'm gonna easy my life a little bit. So. This paper is about testing identif identifying ascension in a fuzzy regression discontinuity design. So the one map that I'm gonna try to, to have during that talk is basically to try to introduce what are the motivation of this paper. I will discuss, uh, this should be quick, I will discuss the model also. And I will you know, spend a lot of time to look at the identification and the testable implication. And I will stress something that we, I usually refer as a sharp testable implication and describe a little bit our test and, you know, the empirical application that we are interested in to it. So feel free to, you know, to ask any question, you know, in the period when I will stop. So, um, the motivation, I think, I, I really like this, this, this quote of like the philosopher Popper that say that the criterion of scientific status of theory is falsifiability, refutability, or testability. So the, the main point here is like, usually in causal inference, when we want, really want to identify causal effect, we are imposing some restriction on the model, on the DGP. And sometimes it's really important to know if those restrictions are compatible with you know, the data that we have. If we impose an assumption that is not testable, you know, regarding to some view, it might not be a very scientific argument because you know, we, we can never reject or you know, refute this type of assumption. So one part of you know, our research agenda is to try to look at those identification conditions that people use in various, um, uh, in various causal inference like uh, setup to try to see if there is a possibility to test those assumptions or if those assumptions have some testable implication. So there is very, you know, in the IV framework, it's the testability of the identifying, identifying assumption is widely discussed in many different framework. And just to remind, to remind you a little bit what we have like in the IV framework, we have the treatment, we have an outcome, and we say that the treatment has an impact on the outcome. And then there is a confounding. Right. And then we say, okay, there is an IV 
that probably are gonna be able to, to get the identification of this model. So this is in general the IV framework that we have. And sometimes when we impose this assumption, we are basically, when you use this framework, you are basically imposing two assumptions. So we say that there is no, the IV does not have any effect on the, confound, on the unobservable confounding, and the IV does not have a direct effect also on the causal outcome. And this is usually what we call independence and exclusion restriction. So Pearl, in, as like in 1994, has discussed the testability of this IV identification assumption, and has derived what he called the Pearl instrumental inequality. So it was like a, a grid framework where we can really see if this type of framework is basically compatible with the data that we observe. Okay, so this has been widely discussed. For example, when the threat, when the we have in the we are in the presence of binary IV model, so YZ and the IV are binary. Turu has showed, for example, that the pearl instrumental inequality are the most informative to screen out the violation of this IV model. Okay, but as soon as the IV Z is continuous or has multiple value. Okay, in the recent paper with Desiree, we have shown that we can have more inequality than the Pearl instrumental inequality. And this is come the question about what are the sharp testable implications, meaning that what is the most informative set of testable implications that we can get from an identification assumption. Okay, and this is basically going to be the goal that we're going to have in that um, in this in this paper but in a very different type of, of, of framework, okay? So the framework that we're gonna look at is gonna be the fuzzy regression discontinuity design, okay? So it's a framework that is widely used in causal inference. People call that the quasi-experimental situation where to get the identification in general, we rely on two fundamental assumptions. This one that we're gonna call the local continuity and then the local monotonicity. So I will, I will give more detail on that uh, soon. So, so the question that we are trying to answer in this paper is what are the testable implications of those assumptions? Because in general, in applied work, you invoke those assumptions and then based on that, you use to get the identification and then you do the estimation. But we may want to be concerned that, okay, could we test those assumptions based on the, you know, on the data and the GDP? So this is basically what we're gonna try to do in, in this paper. And we're gonna try to form, you know, to formalize and to derive what we're gonna call a sharp test for this fuzzy regression discontinuity design. So our test is gonna be different to many existing tests that are usually called the no-manipulation test. Okay, so those ma no-manipulation tests gonna have a properties that are usually called a non-logical property in the sense that those tests might be rejected while the k-identification assumptions are valid, or the, K or the test might not be rejected while the k-identification assumptions are violated. And this type of properties is very weird, okay, in, in, in the sense. So what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to provide an alternative test. We would gonna have a more logical properties in such in, in the sense that as soon as our test is rejected, it is clear that the k-identification assumption is valid. Okay, so this is basically what we, we're gonna try to, to do in that, in that paper. So this is what we try to do in that paper, okay? So this is what we, we basically, this is what this, um, this slide is trying to, to, to show. So we're gonna basically use the full information that we're gonna have, like the outcome, the treatment, and then the running variable to develop a test to test the k-identification assumption in the model. So there are two empirical implications that you're gonna see in the, in the paper that I think gonna be very important to try to, to, you know, to highlight our key contribution is we're gonna give you two applications. In the first application, the existing tests, okay, of uh, manipulation, of no manipulation, gonna be rejected while our existing tests, while our new tests will not be rejected, okay? And in the second application, it's gonna be different, okay? The existing test gonna go, will not be rejected, but our new test will reject the k-identification assumption. And this, this might happen because there is this, you know, this logical consistency between those two different types of, of tests that we're gonna, we're gonna have, okay? So 
just to, to, to give some view on the literature. So the regression discontinuity design has been introduced by two Donald. I think you have to be named Donald to, to understand this regression discontinuity stuff. And th there are many work on that because there are many surveys from like from events and Lemieux and like many different in the identification also. There is like this influential paper of like Han Todd and Van der Klaw that we're gonna rely on. Okay. And many work on inference and specification test. Our contribution is a little bit related to the specification test. And we're gonna, we're gonna try to convince you how our specification test is gonna be different from the existing specification test that we have in the in the literature. Okay. So now let's try to introduce the model and the and the setup and to have like more to go more deeply in the in the main part of this paper. So we're gonna consider a probability space, okay, denoted by omega. And this small omega gonna represent a small uh, one particular agent that we have in the population. So R is gonna be the running variable. So what we're gonna mean by the running variable here, just to to make like a very quick uh, interpretation of the RD design is in general in this quasi experimental design. For example, think about that you you are interested into the treatment, which is basically an, ad, an admission to a PhD program, and then this admission is based on the score on the test score that you're gonna have in an exam. Okay, so this test score is gonna be for us the running variable, and the criteria to be enrolled in the PhD program is if your test score is bigger to one particular type of cutoff. And this cutoff, this is what we're gonna refer to R0 here, okay? So R gonna be our test score and R0 gonna be the cutoff under which I am assigning the, the individual to a particular treatment. We're gonna define D, RW, is gonna define the potential treatment. So you take an agent, you know, omega, and DR is going to be what will be his treatment assignment if he running if his running variable was externally set to the value R. Okay, so I is a running variable here, and the same thing here is going to define the potential treatment. So the potential treatment are defined by two main index, the D and the R. Okay, so what that means is this is going to define the potential outcome if the individual is externally set to the treatment small d, in the same time his running variable is externally set to r, okay? So if you think in terms of the IV in general, people have right ydz, like the potential outcome when the treatment is externally set to d, and then the IV to z. And when you assume the exclusion, for example, you're gonna say this for z different from z prime, okay? Here, we will not have to assume this exclusion type of restriction. So we're gonna allow the running variable to affect the potential outcome, okay, directly. So the, now we're gonna define the observable variable. So D is gonna be the treatment. The treatment is gonna definitively depend on the running variable, R, okay. And here we have the potential outcome notation. So Y1R and Y0R are the two potential outcome respect to where you have been externally set to the treatment, okay? So this is basically the design. It's a very simple design. It very look like the usual IV type of state of that we have in, in, in general. Now, the key point in all regression discontinuity design is the fact that the treatment has a discontinuity in the, at some particular value R0. So this is six here gonna be what we refer to as R0. So think about that you get assigned to the treatment if you have a score that is bigger than six, for example, okay? So because having this score that's bigger than six, you're gonna create a jump in your assignment probability. That's why we're gonna have this, this jump here. Now, if the, we're gonna say that this, the design is sharp, if the jump starting from zero to one, so if we have this huge cutoff here, we're gonna say that we have a sharp design, okay? So the fuzzy design is when the jump is lower than, you know, zero to one. So this is gonna be the key point of this, of this model, okay? So now we're gonna, I, I'm gonna introduce the compliance type, which really looks like the events and angry compliance type that we have in, in, in the usual IV. 
IV setup. So we have the full population, okay? And then we're gonna break down the population in different subgroups, okay? And this subgroup subgroup gonna be defined on how those individuals are assigned to the treatment, okay? And we're gonna call the always taker as those individuals that around the cutoff, they're gonna always be treated, okay? So even if the running variable, even if the score is below the cutoff, they're gonna be treated being the treatment. If it's above the cutoff, they're gonna be the treatment. They're gonna always be treated. The complier is those who are treated only if they are above the cutoff. So they're basically complied to the treatment rule, okay? So to the assignment rule. The neighbor takers is usually the, the same things, like I construct a board around the cutoff. So this is basically the intuition that we have. Here is the cutoff, for example. And then I am constructing a ball, a small ball here around the cutoff. And then I am defining those compliance types. Okay. So the neighbor taker is going to be the one who's just below the cutoff or above the cutoff. He'll never be treated. Okay. So this is the neighbor taker. And then one point is going to be the defiers. So the defiers is going to be those people that go in the opposite direction of the rule. So, you know, they are above the cutoff. You know, they do not. To get the treatment, they are not. They are not treated. They do not decide to not be treated actually, and then they are below the cutoff, and they decide to be treated. So this is going to be the defier. So now, the 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 the, the new things here compared to the usual um, IV setup is we're going to have a group, a remaining group which not belong to all of those four groups, and then we're going to call the indefinite group. The reason is because we have this running variable that flow around, and then it may have some individual that's gonna have very weird behavior around the limit okay, on, on, on that board. So we're gonna collect all those individuals, and then we're gonna put that in the group that we're gonna call the indefinite group, okay? So this type of like defining the compliance type over whole population has been discussed in various papers like before, before us. And then this is gonna allow us to introduce the key identification assumption that we really need to get the identification in the phase regression discontinuity design. Okay, so the first point is what we're gonna call the local monotonicity. We're gonna assume that the population of the fires you know, close to the cutoff is equal to zero. Okay, so the defiers. And also this indefinite population, the population that has very weird behavior around the cutoff, okay? We're gonna assume that those subgroup of population doesn't exist, okay? And this is really looks like the events and angry's monotonicity assumption, okay? That in the late framework is corresponding also to the threshold crossing, you know, model that we know. Now the second important assumption that we really need here is gonna be the local continuity, okay? So the local continuity, I think, is one of the key assumptions in the, in the regression discontinuity design. And the, 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 the intuition is this following, right? So you have those keys that are around the cutoff, okay? And just if you have like uh, a score, this is above the cutoff, you get assigned. Below the cutoff, you do not get assigned. But because you want to compare those two groups, you want to have to be sure that those two keys in terms of unobservable are similar. Around the cutoff. This is the key point of the regression discontinuity design because if you take those individuals that have very high score and very low score, we know that they are different. But if you are in the setup, for example, where the individuals are very close to the cutoff, for example, some the you know the the right the cutoff point is seventy percent, and then you get sixty nine percent, and another kid gets seventy one percent. So they are very close to the cutoff. The only difference, they are assigned to two different groups, but the only difference is that you are just below and just above. And then this assumption assumes that the, you know, the skill of the skill is gonna be smooth around the scatter, okay? And this smoothness is really important to introduce some, some comparability between those two different individuals. So this is basically what we're gonna assume here. This continuity assumption is gonna be really the key of the, identification condition in the, in the regression discontinuity design framework, okay? It's, it's much weaker than the, you know, the independence assumption usually assume, okay, in this, in, in this type of model. So under those two assumptions, 
those two continuity assumptions, we can actually identify the distribution, the potential outcome distribution for the subgroup of compliers. Okay, so remember we defined three groups, uh, four groups before always takers, compliers, never takers, and defiers. We assume that those, defi those defiers does not exist in the population. And then the, the three remaining groups that we have are the following. And if you use the standard argument, it's basically the world estimate that you use, but you apply to the distribution, you get exactly the distribution of the subpopulation of compliers that you're gonna have here. Okay, so this is the K identification assumption using just the world estimate, okay? So just below the cutoff, okay? And then here you are just above the cutoff and here you are below the cutoff and then you make that difference is the world estimate that you apply to this local things. But the key point here that I think it's really important is this is entirely observable from the population at the population level, okay? If I know the population level, I know that it's observable. Under the identifying assumption, I know that this is a distribution. And because it is a distribution, this quantity has to respect all the properties of a distribution. And we know that the distribution has to be positive and monotone, okay? And this quantity, nothing prevents this quantity to be, mono, to be non monotone so the identification, the testable implication that you're gonna be interested in here is gonna be if this world estimate, okay, is monotone in Y. Because if it's not monotone in Y, it means that it's not a well-defined CDF. So you cannot interpret this as a distribution for the compliance, okay? So this is actually the main testable implication we're gonna to try to derive in this setup. And this is basically the main theorem that we're gonna have for that, okay? So if you look at well, the monotone, these terms in the bottom does not really depend on Y, okay? So the monotonicity of that quantity just depend on the numerator, okay? And this is what we can basically write like that. So this is, is related to the potential outcome of Y1 for the compliers. And this one gonna be related to the potential outcome of Y0 for the compliers. Okay, so this is basically the, K, the, the testable application. <clears throat> but what, <clears throat> what is very important for me in that theorem is the second part of the theorem. Because the second part of the theorem said, <clears throat> so the first part of the theorem said, if the local continuity and then the local <clears throat> monotonicity are valid, those inequalities should be respected for all Y. But the second part say that if those are valid, I can never reject the identification condition, okay, of the, sharp, of the, of the, of the fuzzy regression discontinuity design. And then the intuition is because when those inequalities are verified, I can always construct Okay, an alternative distribution that's gonna rationalize the data. Okay, and this is the type of construction. So we can see the, constru the construction in the proof, but we can, we're gonna give a distribution, observable distribution to the compliers. That's gonna be exactly this one. And then we're gonna give a distribution to the always takers in such a way that we're gonna have always, we can always match our construction gonna always match the observable distribution, okay? And this is gonna be the key point for us, okay? This is gonna define the concept that what we're gonna call the sharp test, okay? Which gather all the necessary and sufficient information to be able to test the validity of this, of this assumption, okay? So, and you know, this discussion of this non-negativity of the, the, this monotonicity of the distribution is basically, means in other way, the non-negativity of the density. This has been discussed in previous paper, like in Back and Pearl, and also I think in events and Gris and Ribbon also, different way. So if you look at this testable implication here, 
if you divide by y minus y prime, by y prime minus y, and you take the limit, you're gonna get the density here, and then you're gonna get the density, a type of density here. So this is what we plot here, okay? So the fact that it is negative, it means that the density, you know, the quasar density, because the density D is equal to one, okay? Has always to dominate this density for the distribution that is below the cutoff, okay? So if you have the whole data, you can plot the distribution here, the density distribution and the other distribution. If you see that they are interact, so for example, something going like that, it's gonna give you a proof of the violation of this monotonicity assumption. Okay, so this is basically, I think I, I will stop for a moment here to see if there's some discussion before I, I continue. If there's some question before. Uh, we haven't received any questions yet, so maybe just uh, go on. Good. So, uh, so one thing, one remark that I think is also also important is instead of taking this continuity assumption that I was the, I was the, I was like presenting, there is other. For example, if you look at um, Han, Todd, and Van der Klaw paper, when they derived the identification in the phasic regression discontinuity design, they impose this independence assumption, okay? And our continuity assumption is an application of this independence assumption, okay? So independent, but something that is really important is to get the identification in the phasic regression discontinuity design, you do not really need, this assumption is a little bit stronger because when you put that assumption, you assume that Y1R is equal to Y1R prime. Okay. Okay. Meaning, in some sense, that there is no particular channel that are going from the running variable up to the outcome of equation. The, the outcome equation. So, for example, if I want to to write this in terms of of graph, for example, I have my R, which is my running variable. I have D, which is my treatment, and Y, my outcome. As I played before, and then this is a confounding, right? And then you have this running variable. So what I am saying is, when we impose that assumption, this exclusion, you get rid of this potential length. Okay. When you impose this exclusion. Okay. And basically, what we allow by this continuity assumption, you will see that in our identification condition, we are not really impose the exclusion restriction. So basically, we can still get identification even if there is a kind of causal, there is a direct link between the running variable and the outcome. What really matter for us is to not have a link like that in this, okay? But we can allow this type of exclusion, okay? But not the, the, the independence assumption if you really want to think in terms of like, of the IV uh, type of framework, okay? so. This is important. Yeah, this is, I think, is really important. This is difference. Now, I, I would like to compare what we do, okay, with the existing testable application of the fuzzy regression discontinuity design. This is what we're going to discuss here a little bit here. But I think I, I will try to explain that in a very simple way. I assume that u is our confounding function, and what I really need are the un our unobservable. What we really need, we need the continuity of u given r and x. So this is the k identification that we need. We need the continuity of that quantity around the cutoff r zero. But what's going to happen is you can write this as usual, right? As these following things. Okay, where well, these are those are density function. So the literature before, the k identification assumption is a continuity of this one. And then the testable implication that has been considered in the literature is this following. They said, if this is discontinuous in R0, or this is discontinuous at R0, it can be an information that this quantity is discontinuous in R0. And then they throw away this information. And the whole information that has been used so far in the literature to test the, the 
to look at the testable implication in the regression discontinuity design was basically looking at the continuity of this one at the cutoff or the continuity of this one at the cutoff. And this continuity of this one at the cutoff, this is the so-called Macquarie test. Okay. And the continuity of the observable characteristics. So sorry, I did not say X is the observable characteristic. Is X the observable characteristic. The continuity of the observable characteristic conditioning to the random variable at the cutoff, it's what has been widely you know, used as a testable implication that has been written, recently de derived, for example, in, in Kane and Kamat, type of ascension. Okay, so this is the Macquarie, this is a Kane and Kamat type of test. Now, the concern that we have with this assumption is if you look at that case, I can have a discontinuity distribution here, but this is going to be discontinuous in such a way that those two discontinuity are going to cancel out, and my remaining function here are going to still be continuous. Okay, so that's why this existing test does not have these logical properties that I was saying, because you can have discontinuity here. You can have a discontinuity here, okay? But this discontinuity may be canceled out with type of discontinuity here or here in such a way that this is gonna be continuous, okay? So in what we are doing, we basically focus directly of that quantity, okay? Instead of looking at the indirect quantity that we have here in this, in this setup. So this is basically the, I think the key intuition of our our identification strategy. And you know, let me try to look at to, to look at with these two, two Venn diagram here. So assuming this is the local the local monotonicity assumption, and this is the local continuity assumption. Okay. And the K identification assumption is this one. So all the GDP that we have here. What we construct as a sharp test, what we call as a sharp test, is we cover here. This is our test. So what is the point here is we can make disentangle all the GDP that are outside here. So if we find that your, your GDP is here, we know that is rejected, right? The issue, the, the simple issue, the issue that we have with our test where we cannot confirm is a GDP can be here. And this should be violated, but we will not be able to get the information of that, okay? Because we will not be able to screen out, okay, the, 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 this GDP. But I can construct many different testable implications. So I can construct another testable implication here. And then the most informative testable implication gonna be the smallest bound, the smallest like circle around the truth. Okay. And then what we call sharp is, because we cannot really, we can no longer, as soon as our testable implication are sharp, we can no longer further refine to go to this, okay? Where we stop is the most powerful ball that we can construct to, you know, to, to screen the GDP in this. Okay, so this is basically what we have in this, uh, do I have a question? Okay, uh, should I answer the question now? You, you may if you'd like, yeah, we have a question okay. that just came in. Um, I can read it to you. Okay, you're right. It says, what's the relationship between this and the Biometrica Instrumental Inequalities paper? <clears throat> okay, so uh, the Biometrica Instrumental Inequality paper, but it was in the IV setup, was basically interesting to the independence assumption. So we do not have like the monotonicity assumption in that, in that model. So we are just interesting to look at what are the testable implication of like the, the independence assumption. Here in the fuzzy regression discontinuity design, we need more than the independence to get identification, to get point identification of the late type of parameter. We need the IV, the, the independence, the exclusion, the continuity, and then the local monotonicity type of assumption. Okay. This is one important difference between the two. Thank you. It's clear. 
so so uh, yes this is what actually what is like the main i think is the main things to, to the main information that we want to bring in that paper is to show that we we have like this sharp you know um testable implication for the phasic regression discontinuity design now what we want to show by this last figure and this is what I call the, the non-logical properties of the McCrary test and the other type of uh, tests that they exist is, think about that this is the fuzzy regression discontinuity test and this should say that. So what's gonna happen is you can reject a GDP, which is not in the McCrary set of like set, but this GDP is in invalid, okay? Because this is the truth. And then the, sa the same thing, you can accept some of the GDP within, you say that, okay, there is no discontinuity in the running variable. So you say that, okay, it's not rejected. So my design should be valid, but actually is outside the distribution, is outside our identification set. Okay, so this is basically one of like uh, the important difference with our testable implication versus the existing testable implication that we have in the, in the literature. So this is the main thing in terms of testable implication. So now we're gonna try, I'm gonna try to go very quickly on the, on how we, we implement the test and it, uh, what we did and try to jump on the empirical application if I, if I do have, um, if I do have time, okay? So, okay, just remind you very quickly Really. So, so here our testable implication, right? So we have the testable implication that we're gonna retransform to see how, so you will see that we have a continuum of inequality. So it's basically inference in moments inequality. So this is basically what we're gonna try to write down in this, in this framework that we have here, okay? So our hypothesis will be to have the sub, so the D here define the different potential outcome. Okay, for the treated, the potential outcome distribution for the treated and for the non treated okay? And then this V function is gonna be this difference. And then the L is gonna define the, because we have the outcome that's gonna belong to some interval, okay? And that interval gonna be defined by this L class, okay? Because you're gonna have like a continuum of like, of inequality. So one difficulty that we have here is if the outcome is continuous, we're gonna have a continuum of inequality here, okay? But inference in conditional in, you know, in the continuum of moment inequality, moment inequality is well, is well known in econometrics. So what we're gonna do this, we're gonna try to use one of them is like the Andrews and she inference in moment inequality that we're gonna try to adapt to the fact that we have our identification only here work only to the limit very close to the cutoff that we're gonna have. So this is basically what we're gonna try to do. So we're gonna trick a little bit this type of um, identification method. So we're gonna just use a simple, a simple, you know, empirical, a simple analog of this function V, okay? And then we're gonna define a kind of case test that we're gonna divide by the standard deviation for the uniformity. And then we're gonna put a trim, you know, trimming parameter just to avoid the denominator to be equal to zero. And, you know, and as usual, you know, if this statistics is very large, we're gonna reject the test. So this is basically what we what we're gonna what we're gonna do in the in, in this model. So the the inference procedure, we're gonna basically use a, a multiplier bootstrap. I think, I think I have eight minutes left or five minutes. Just yeah, to about eight minutes. Yeah. Eight, eight minutes. Okay. So what we're gonna do for the inference procedure, we're gonna look at all the term here, and then we're gonna look at uh, we're gonna use a local linear estimator to estimate all those terms. Okay. And then we we're gonna use like a multiplier bootstrap to basically try to estimate this quantity. And as I said, I think the main contribution in that inference section was basically to tr to trick a little bit the Andrews and she moment unconditional moment inequality in the case when we have like these limits, you know, that we have to deal with. Okay, so I, I, I will probably try to, to jump a little bit. Something that I think is really important is, is the fact that we do not have like optimal bandwidth for the specification test. 
So we do not use optimal bandwidth for this test. There exists some bandwidth that people use when they estimate, okay, the fuzzy, the, the late in the fuzzy regression discontinuity design. And then we're gonna use this series of bandwidth to try to estimate, you know, to do our, to do our test. Okay. So, um, in the paper, for example, we're gonna we're gonna use this Ebens and Kalia Naraman type of that the IK type of bandwidth. We're gonna also use the CCT and then you know the Yoshi and Ishimura type of bandwidth. Okay, so we're gonna use some you know you're gonna we're gonna correct also using this um, MSC and different. So we're gonna try different type of uh, of scenario to see. I will not show you the size here of the test, but I'm gonna basically show you um, the, the power of the test. But before that, something that is very important is if the outcome is continuous, I have many Y. Okay. So the, the set of the, the, is very long. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do some coarsening okay, of the interval that we're gonna try to, to use to do the test because we cannot implement over, over R. Okay. So this is, for example, the two, um, simulation for you know for different power that we have in general we should have this to not be violated but when we have this difference it means that the assumption is violated okay so we're gonna look at look at all those three all those four GDP and try to look at how our test performs you know, regarding to this and this is basically what we had in terms of of power of the test for those four GDPs, okay? The simple thing that I want to, 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 to take a look is the power of four. If you look at it, the power of four is where our test perform less. And if you look at this, is this scenario. And why we have this scenario, why you know, our test perform a little bit less in that scenario is because again, when we do the test, we want to, to detect the violation. And then we use some bin as an interval. So if we do not use a very small bin, we cannot really detect those small spike, spike that we have here. So what's gonna happen is if you take some average over that bin, the mean here can be a little bit, you know, in that way. So we will not be able. So when we have very small spike that violated, it might be a little bit difficult for our, our test to screen, to screen out the, the, the violation. Right? Otherwise, in terms of, of power at a different size, we are doing like, you know, I think relatively okay in terms of in terms of the test. Okay. So let me take those last three or five minutes to discuss the one of the empirical application. So we're gonna look at this empirical application that has been discussed in Angris and Levy. So the question was to basically look at what was the what is the impact of the class size of the performance of the of the kit. And then, in, okay, so to put you in the context is like, in, it seems that in this country, they have a rule where a class size cannot exceed more than 40 students. So we have different enrollments and when the enrollment reach to 40, we split the class in two. So the good things is the discontinuity here is if you look at that graph. So if you get your child enrolled and then they are 41, they may split the class to get around 20. So your, your kid gonna be in the smaller size of class, okay? So being in the smaller or bigger size of class gonna really depend on that cutoff, okay? And then the question was basically to use this discontinuity to try to look at what was the, what is the impact of the class size, you know, of the, on the score of the kid, okay? So here, what's gonna happen is, if you look at the density of the running variable at this different cutoff, you see, for example, at the cutoff 40, we see a little bit some slowdown here. So like you have the F of R, the R, you know, so this is the density, the, the density at the cutoff. So there's some paper that has been testing this, and then they found that there's a discontinuity at the, at the cutoff at the, at the, at the 40. And then if you think about the existing test, they're gonna tell you this discontinuity means that the design is not valid, right? And what we're gonna do, we're gonna try to do our test to try to see if 
even if we have this type of discontinuity, if we reject this design or not, okay? But before talking about that, there's like a recent paper of Hungary that come back and to try to discuss to, to say that even if there is a discontinuity in the density, they do not think that this discontinuity is very a threat to the identification strategy. And, and, uh, and the, reason, the reason was this following thing, right? It seems that in Israel, some of the school really want to manipulate around the cutoff to have more staff, because if they have low, many classes, they're gonna have more staff. So sometimes they enroll the student, they increase the enrollment just to divide the, the size of the class. And then the question is, okay, if you have this type of manipulation, clearly you're gonna have this continuity on the running variable at the cutoff. But the, qu the question is that, is that this manipulation impacting the care identification assumption? Because you can manipulate, but if, you manipulate in the way that is not correlated with the skill of the kid, you are not basically um, killing the RD design. So the RD design might be valid if the manipulation is not affecting the, the, you know, the distribution of the skill of the kid. Okay, this was the, 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 the key point. So we're gonna try to test the same thing using our approach to see if we're gonna reject or we will not reject this. this. And this is basically what we have in, in our test. We use like many different bandwidth. Okay, this was the bandwidth that was used in the seminal paper, okay? And then we use like the AI bandwidth, the IQ, the IK bandwidth and the CCT. In most of the case, we do not, we never reject actually this assumption in, in, in general. So, okay, so when we, don't, we never reject, Things a little bit uh, real because this is the set of assumption. Assume that this is a set of GDP of the true identification assumption. And remember that what we test is this. If the GDP is outside here. So we never reject, maybe because it's here, the true GDP is here, but it might be the case also that the true GDP is here, right? But there is no enough power Okay, in terms of observable, because what we say that to, to be able to falsify this identification design that we, we have in this, in this model. I think I am, I am running late. So I think this is basically what I, I, I was trying to, to discuss with you today. So we derived the, just to conclude, we derived the testable implication for the fuzzy regression discontinuity design. So we show that our testable implication are sharp. I think this is a key point of this paper. Okay, so screen all, you know, the, the K identification assumption, and then we propose a non-parametric test and procedure for it. So the final sample seems to work well. So, okay, we, we, we want to say that to most up, to more applied researchers that in addition to what they used before, they can try also our test because it's a complementary with the type of existing test that we, we have in the literature. That was all for today. Uh, great, thanks Ismail for the nice talk. We're now switching over to the discussion, so we will uh, we will start with that now. Um, yeah, uh, Toro, uh, whenever you're ready. And then after that, Ismail can respond uh, uh, if he wants. You mean uh, Juan? Ah, uh, Juan, sorry. I have to stop sharing the screen. Can everybody hear me okay and see my screen? Yep. Excellent. Uh, so hi, my name is John Pei and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Policy Analysis and Management at Cornell. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to talk about the paper by Arai et al. I find it to be an impressive piece. So here is the outline of my discussion. First, I'm going to recap the intuition of the proposed test. I will highlight in particular this curious relationship between the power of the test and the first stage, which will then lead to the discussion of alternative identifying assumptions and the role of covariates. So uh, the proposed test 
aims to assess jointly the two assumptions underlying a fuzzy RD design. The first is local monotonicity in potential treatments, and the second is local continuity in the joint distribution of potential outcomes and compliance types. So these uh, map naturally to the late framework for randomized experiments. Local monotonicity corresponds to monotonicity and local continuity corresponds to the exclusion restriction and independence induced by the random assignment. So uh, the test is based on these two population inequalities. Because of symmetry, I'm going to focus on the first one. For exposition, I will translate from RD to RCT and all the intuitions should carry through. To further simplify, I'm going to consider the case where Y is binary with Y and Y prime both equal to one. With that, the blue term here, which corresponds to observations below the RD threshold, maps to the control group in the RCT, and the red term maps to the treatment. Also, the indicator function simply becomes the indicator that Y is equal to one, and if you will, this is simply Y itself. It is easy to show that these two terms are the joint probabilities that Y and D are both equal to one for the control and treatment respectively. So now I am going to put the uh, inequality up there and I'm going to use this simple diagram to go over the intuition. The left rectangle represents the control group and the one on the right represents the treatment. Under monotonicity, each group consists of three strata, always takers, compliers, and never takers. The area of each slice represents the proportion of the stratum. So here we have more compliers than never takers, than always takers. With random assignment, the sizes of the three strata will have to be the same across treatment and control. These three strata give me the, the treatment take up in each group. So for the control, the D equal to one population consists of the always takers only and the D equal to one population in the treatment has additionally the compliers in it. Now I'm going to bring in the Y. The shaded area represents the population with Y equal to one and the unshaded Y equal to zero. Each shaded rectangle represents the joint probability that Y is one and the individual is a particular compliance type conditional on either being in the, in the control or the treatment. Under exclusion and independence, the two green rectangles for the always takers have the same area because Y is equal to Y1 for both treatment and control. Likewise, the gray rectangles for the never takers also have the same size. The same is not true for the complier rectangles. And their difference here is simply the intent to treat. So how do we represent these two probabilities over here? Well, the blue term, the probability that Y and D are both equal to one is simply uh, the area of this blue triangle, uh, rectangle. The red term translates to the combination of, th of these two rectangles, Y is one, D equal to one for the treatment. So uh, the inequality holds under the late assumptions because of the existence of this piece. So another way to look at this, which is what Ishmael talked about, is that we can subtract the blue from the red. And then we can identify the distribution of the compliers after scaling. And if that difference is negative, we may worry about the assumptions being violated. So this is the point that Balki and Pearl made, and also, uh, as Ishmael pointed out, Imbens and Rubin uh, in a reset piece also makes this point. So now, how do we break this inequality? One way is to violate monotonicity. And so here, we're going to bring in the additional defier group because, because monotonicity no longer holds. And what that is going to do is to introduce this additional piece in the blue term. So some of the people in the control group actually take up treatment, and they, they wouldn't uh, 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 when they're treated. So now the combined blue rectangles is going to outweigh the combined area of the, rec of the red rectangles. And so this violates the inequality. Another way to break it is to, to violate the exclusion independence. So here's a case where monotonicity still holds, 
because there are no defiers, but independence and maybe exclusion doesn't because there are now more always takers in the control group. And also within, the, within this, this group, uh, there are more people with y1 equal one. As a result, you have the blue area larger than the red, red area. Now with these diagrams, I'm going to highlight this curious, curious relationship between, for the lack of a better word, the power of the test and the first stage. Now I'm going to go back to the previous picture, where the inequality doesn't hold because exclusion independence is violated. To break the inequality, I really had to go out of my way and draw this gigantic, gigantic big blue rectangle. Uh, because otherwise, I may not be able to break it, even if the identifying assumption is violated. So here's an uh, illustration. The blue rectangle here is larger than the rect red rectangle for the always takers. And this indicates violation of exclusion or independence. But the blue rectangle is simply not large enough to overturn the inequality because how big this red piece is. And one reason for that is that the first stage, which in this case is the, the proportion of the compliers, is fairly large. So it is much easier to actually break this inequality when the proportion of compliers is small. Right? So this is the same scenario, and now the, the blue is larger than the red. So um, the authors definitely discuss this point uh, in their paper. In fact, they carefully document this uh, in this figure, figure two of the paper, that the power of their test decreases with the size of the first stage coefficient in their simulations. And you notice that the test actually has no power when the first stage is above 0.8. In the author's words, the testable implication loses screening power when the fuzzy RD design is close to a sharp design. So what happens in a sharp design? Well, under perfect compliance, monotonicity is going to hold. And what happens here is that within the control group, D is always zero. So, uh, so the blue term has to be always equal to zero. And so this inequality always holds. And in other words, it is impossible to test the independence exclusion restriction in RCT or continuity assumption in ERD under perfect compliance. So, um, so this observation sets up the discussion of alternative identifying assumptions and the role of covariance. Um, so the question now is, um, sh what should we do under perfect compliance? Should we give up on testing and call popper or, um, or something else? So I think the, the answer in general is that we probably shouldn't give up just yet. So in an RCT, uh, if you believe in randomization, typically you're, you're willing to assume that in addition to Y1, Y0, D1, D0, X, some baseline covariate is also independent to Z. And if you make this assumption, then X should be balanced across treatment control. And in an RD, the identifying assumptions of Li, as Ishmael pointed out, imply the density of running variable and the distribution of the X should be continuous. So um, I understand that the authors want to test the minimal assumptions that allow the late interpretation in fuzzy RD, uh, and their exercise doesn't concern covariates. Uh, I should just point out that from a, a practitioner's point of view, it is often standard to use covariates to test fuzzy RD validity in practice. So here's an example from Morkiola and Berhugan 2009 AER. Uh, so this is, I mean, the, the context is actually uh, similar to uh, the example that the authors give. And so this is the treatment variable here is class size. The, X, uh, the x-axis is enrollment, uh, except that this is in Chile. Um, the solid line, plots the class size cap rules. So those are the, so that's the statutory rule. And you have a much smaller class size as the enrollment exceeds a threshold. As you can see, there's some deviation from the rules. So this is a fuzzy uh, RD design, if you will. So when you look at the distribution, the histogram of the running variable, you see clear evidence of benching, which is a lot more severe than what we saw in the, in the angriest example that the author showed. So the question here is that, should we worry about manipulation? Well, it turns out that the covariates can actually provide some answers. So uh, the two graphs here plot household income and mother's year of, years of education against the running variable. And you see that, that there are discontinuities at the first threshold. It, has, it suggests that kids in small classes just over the first cutoff come from richer families, which cast out on the validity of the RD. So the, the Rukiola and Berhugan paper is very much about the sorting behavior. So looking at 
the covariates here helps paint the story. And I believe that Angus and co-authors also examined covariates in their 2019 paper. So here's the kind of the upshot of this discussion. The issue here is that the proposed test doesn't quite extend to perfect compliance, and that's, that's totally okay. But, but it means that in a sharp RD, we have to rely on a different set of assumptions to test. So, so that might feel a little awkward. And so, um, and on top of that, practitioners typically use uh, covariates information anyway in a fuzzy RD. So I think that one future uh, direction is to extend the idea of proposed test to RD frameworks incorporating covariates. So coming, coming from a sharp test, if you will, uh, in, the, in the fuzzy case with covariates in, uh, incorporated. So Donardo and Lee uh, write down such a framework in their handbook of labor chapter. And uh, Dome doesn't explicitly do this, but it's pretty easy to extend her framework to incorporate covariates as, as well. Uh, in final remark, I think this is a very nice paper uh, and I'd be very happy if I had written it. And there's much more than what I can discuss here. So I encourage people to, to check out the paper. I think it adds to this great literature on testing the assumptions in late models and thinking about the implications when you relax the assumptions. The authors have made other nice contributions to this literature, which I also rec recommend people to look at. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thanks for the discussion. Uh, Ismail, do you wanna respond? Yes, Quick. just to uh, few, I think, thank you very much, Juan, for the, you know, for the presentation. It was like probably much easier to understand than my presentation. So thank you for that. <laughs> so so to, uh, I think, Regarding your point, so the first point regarding the fact that we do not have power if there is a sharp RD, this is entirely true. So we do not have power when you, when you have the sharp RD as the way that you, you present. And now the second point about the covariate. I think our test can take information with the covariate and then we have like one subsection in the appendix where we take information about the covariate. But one thing that I want to to, to clarify is if you look at the, let me see if I can quickly share my screen. Sorry about that, give me a minute. Okay, good. So, in in the is the is the way that we ha we have to take the information about the covariate is if you look at the k identification assumption that I am writing that I have been writing here, which is uh, here. So the similar k identification assumption actually, this is all just for simplicity, but can be conditioning also on x. Okay, so our test basically, it can be implemented for every conditioning to X. So by screening all the information that we're gonna have in the Kovari uh, setup. So we can do this and then we show that in, the, in, in, the, in one of the appendix, how, to, how to, to include. Now the assumption that of the Kovari that you present is a little bit slightly different because here, if you want to put in the IV framework that we have, you have Y1, Y0, Z1, and Z0. It's gonna be independent to Z, but given X. So this is what our test is also sharp for this. But what you, you I think you have in mind is a, is a test in that way. So is a is assumption more in that way. And this is a little bit different, right? So if you really want to, to accept this assumption, that's true that we can get a little bit more information and then probably we can find some type of like of assumption. It's, it's because the way that we see this, we really think that the identification condition are for any conditioning to any covariate. And then the X can be depend, can depend on Z. So X and Z can be, can have like uh, correlated here in the setup that you do, and then that we use, that is often used in some of the applied, they use this additional restriction where they basically have the IV itself, which is independent to the to the to X, right? To the to, to the X. So that I think if we want to go on that direction that you pointed out, there is something that we can do more. 
to have like um, information. But if we want to stick this to this type of conditioning to X, our test remains kind of of sharp in in the sense. So this is the, this is what I, I want to add for 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 this comment. But thank you very much. All right, great, thanks. I think it's uh, now time to uh, slowly uh, wrap up. Uh, one second. All right, first of all, thank you so much, Ismail, for a great talk. Uh, thanks, uh, Toro, for uh, helping out in Q&A, and thanks, uh, Juan, for a very nice uh, discussion. Um, so next week, uh, we're going to have a talk by uh, David Bly from Colombia, who will talk about the deconfounder. What is it? What is its theory? Is it useful? Uh, and as a discussant, we will have Rido, uh, who's also an organizer here. Um, but again, thank you all for coming. I hope you have a nice week, and uh, see you. see you next time. Thank you.